morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, I'm Mark Herkin, and uh, you've joined the Thyroid Journal Club. Um, as I mentioned last week, we are running this on a weekly basis um, and for the foreseeable future, and we will certainly be giving you information about upcoming speakers and topics. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Robenstock, who is uh, joining us from Israel. He is an endocrinologist and thyroid cancer specialist um, at Rabin Medical Center, and he also heads up the thyroid cancer service at the Davidoff Cancer Center in Israel. A more complete bio is available um, in some of the promotional emails that we send out to you. And I'm also extremely pleased to have Dr. Mike Tuttle, um, who uh, most of you know, and um, who was actually Dr. Um, Robenstock's um, fellowship director uh, several years ago um, when he was uh, spent a year in New York. Um, so I all thank you once again and look forward to your presentation here. Okay, so thanks again for the invitation. It's a great honor as always. Mm -hmm. And during the 30, 40 minutes uh, that we have, we'll discuss a study that we did and then we'll do a discussion with Mike Tuttle from Memorial Sloan Kettering and uh, the manuscript is available uh, online. So the, the topic that we're going to discuss is response to therapy. And it's a big thing now. Mike Tuttle uh, suggested this system in 2010, and it was adopted by the 2015 ATA guidelines. And now in the guidelines, it's almost six pages about response to therapy. It's well validated, and it guides us in follow-up, deciding who needs TSH suppression, how much TSH suppression, uh, risk of recurrence. We, need, we want to know, the patients want to know what to expect. Uh, and it's such a useful tool that we want to know whether we can use this type of system always, also in patients who have lobectomy. And to answer that, uh, Mike Tuttle again, and uh, Denise Mosemo in 2016 suggested a new system for patients who were treated without radioactive iodine, either total thyroidectomy without radioactive iodine or lobectomy, which is our topic today. And they concluded that they have a system which looks validated, looks promising for these types of patients. So let's look at this classification, this system. So we have the response to therapy, um, excellent response, incomplete response, indeterminate response, the same language that we used to from patients who had total thyroidectomy. And if we look at the how we may we decide if someone has excellent response to therapy or not, so they need to have a normal uh, imaging and and that's the key uh, that we wanted to study, uh, was thyroglobulin below 30. So with thyroglobulin below 30, you can have excellent response to therapy. And when you have higher than 30 nanograms per ml, then you're considered biochemical incomplete, which affects the way we think about the patient, the way we follow patient. Now, in clinic, we sometimes see patients who have higher thyroglobulin, and they do really well. And we have some patients who have thyroglobulin of 10 and 20, and they have recurrences. So we really wanted to focus on this one item, this thyroglobulin threshold after after lobectomy. So we wanted to define the normal range. It means taking all these patients who had lobectomy, just looking what's the, the standard, the, the median, the mean, the, the standard deviation, and more importantly, to see what's the prognostic value of that TG following the vectum. So the methods, inclusion criteria were adults with PTC. We decided not to include follicular cancer or herpetal cell because the natural history is different than papillary thyroid carcinoma.
uh, at least one year of follow-up without completion after uh, the telobectomy and sufficient data on thioglobulin and antibodies. Ex exclusion criteria were patients with uh, diseases other than PTC, uh, more larger than four centimeter, gross extrathyroidal extension. We did include patients with minimal extrathyroidal extension because we, if it's a small tube, tumor with minimal extrathyroidal extension, we consider them as low risk patients. And we excluded patients with metastasis, either to lymph nodes or distant metastasis. So we went over all the database of our surgical service, um, more than 2,000 unilateral lobectomies in, on record. Many of them were lost to follow up, which we did in other hospitals, uh, had two stage uh, surgery. And eventually, patients who had sufficient data on thioglobulin on the clinical course were 167 patients. So this was the study group, the included group follow up the, the data that we collected. So the patient had lobectomy, then one year of follow up. We collected data about thioglobulin and antibodies the first year after surgery and then during follow up. And then we looked who had completion and who had cancer and then evaluated the prognostic value of that number. The variables that we thought about, what do we want to examine when thinking about these thioglobulin levels after lobectomy? So first, we wanted to see if patient characteristics play a role, gender, age, PTC characteristics of the disease that was taken out. That means the size of the rejected tumor, minimal osteothroidal extension, uh, variant, all in the rejected lobe, and most importantly, the characteristics of the remaining lobe, the contralateral lobe. And many times when patients have high thioglobulin after surgery, let's say 60 nanograms per ml or more, we say, well, probably they have a Shimoto's thyroiditis, maybe they have a contralateral benign nodule that is responsible for that. So we wanted to take a look to investigate the impact of Hashimoto's thyroiditis on thioglobulin and of contralateral nodules. So the results. The male to female ratio, the female to male ratio was seven to one as expected. The median age was 53. The median size was nine millimeters. It makes sense for patients who have lobectomy. And the range was pretty large, between 0.5 and 4 centimeter. Uh, about 50% of patients, 49%, had tumors larger than 1 centimeter. So we were able to, to examine uh, micropapillary and uh, tumors larger than 1 centimeter. Do they behave differently after lobectomy? 69% of patients had classic PTC, 29% follicular variant and only 2% had other variants. These were small tumors, so the patients, so the patients uh, didn't have a completion thyroidectomy. 14% of patients had multifocal disease without uh, any uh, abnormalities in the remaining globe, and 9% had small tumors with minimal extrathyroidal extension Again, we consider them low risk tumor. So the primary tumor in all cases was stage one disease. So overall, the description of this cohort is, is a typical group of patients who would have lobectomy. So let's look at thioglobulin. This is our main outcome. So the first year thioglobulin, the whole cohort was 12.1 with standard deviation of 14.8 nanograms per ml. So, so far it looks promising. It's well below the 30 uh, nanograms per ml threshold. The median was 
and the range was up to 106. So obviously we have patients with higher thyroid globulin and 20 patients had antibodies. Uh, here you see the, the levels, the titers of the antibodies. In our lab, normal titers is below 40 and undetectable is below 20. So first we wanted to see, to look at the patient characteristics characteristics and the resected tumor characteristics. So there was no correlation between thyroglobulin after surgery with age and gender, and there was no correlation between postoperative thyroglobulin and size of PTC, whether it was micro or larger than one centimeter, minimal arthroidal extension, or histopathological variant. So we looked at the initial thyroglobulin levels. Now the mean follow-up was six and a half years. You see the standard deviation here. And here you see the dynamics of thyroglobulin along the years. If you look at individual patients, we didn't see any pattern. There are some uh, suggest other studies suggesting thyroglobulin rises over time, decreases over time, we didn't find any um, um, concrete pattern. And you can say that maybe the variation that we saw during follow-up are due to changes in TSH levels. So here you can see the mean and standard deviation TSH along the years. Generally, we don't suppress thyroglobulin patients following lobectomy for low risk disease. And the levels were pretty stable. We did some more analysis for TSH, and that's in the in the study, but we didn't find TSH to, to play a major role in the levels of, uh, of thyroglobulin, mostly because most patients had well-controlled levels. Now, looking at individual patients, 36% had increase during follow-up of by 5.1 uh, nanograms per ml on average. 42 patients had decrease in thyroglobulin and 22% had stable levels. Now, these numbers are with very high sensitivity threshold. So these numbers are for changes larger than one nanograms per ml. And we used other thresholds. So for example, 46% of patients had a change larger than nine, than five nanograms per ml during follow-up. Again, all the, the same ratio. Uh, most of them had decreased, some had increased, and 8% of patients had extreme changes in thyroglobulin of more than 20 nanograms per ml. Just to take a quick look at these patients, eight patients had increase and only two had recurrence and five had decrease of more than 20 nanograms per ml and didn't have recurrences. Now, this is the first time we, we mention recurrences. So that leads us to the next question. Okay, we have this uh, population. These are the thyroglobulin numbers. Now let's look at recurrences and the prognostic value of thyroglobulin. So 18%, 18 patients, which is 11% of patients, had completion surgery, 12 had malignant disease, 6 had benign disease, and of the malignant disease, 8 patients had contralateral PTC, and 4 patients had neck metastasis. So now let's look at the recurrence group versus non-recurrence group in terms of thyroglobulin, the first year of follow-up. And here you see the numbers. So just looking at the, table, at the, at the graph, you can see that the mean level in the recurrent group was higher than the no, non-recurrent group. Uh, the mean level was 22.5 nanograms per ml. So the average level in patients who had recurrence was lower than 30 nanograms per ml. But you can also see the high uh, standard deviation. 
that means that the overlap between the two groups was very significant. So if you just look at the numbers, we would give you the table, first year of diaglobulin, you would look at the table, you couldn't say which one will have recurrence and which will not. And looking specifically at the 30 nanograms per ml threshold, so of 12 patients who had recurrence, only two patients had levels higher than 30. And in the non-recurrent group, 11 patients had levels higher than 30 and up to 103 without recurrence. So in this aspect, thioglobulin did not predict recurrence and just looking first year uh, didn't tell us who will have and who will not have recurrence. Here you see a table, it's in the manuscript. Uh, all the thioglobulin levels in patients who had completion thyroidectomy. So for example, you have these two patients with uh, thioglobulin, initial thioglobulin levels higher than 30. One had increased level uh, and then completion surgery. The other one had some decrease and completion surgery. So the next question is maybe it's not the initial thioglobulin, maybe it's the dynamics over time that will tell us who has recurrence and who does not. And here we looked at change in thioglobulin levels and the follow-up in patients who had completion thyroidectomy. So the end point for follow-up was the completion thyroidectomy was uh, an average of 3.7 years. Out of 12 patients, four had a steady increase of thioglobulin. In two, thioglobulin was stable. And in six patients, one of them had antibodies who de which decreased over time. Six patients had decreased in thioglobulin. So not only the initial thioglobulin levels did not tell us who will have recurrence and who will not, but also the dynamics were not predictive of recurrence. And just to mention that none of the patients who were in, a stu in our study, 167 patients, none had completion thyroidectomy based on thioglobulin or thioglobulin change. Um, which is interesting and will relate to the discussion we'll have later to the role of thioglobulin versus imaging in these patients. Now, just to mention one patient, the one patient who had recurrence with antibodies, um, obviously she was married to a doctor who is a friend of mine, so it's always risky to treat uh, friends. She had a five millimeter PTC. Uh, it was it looked pretty promising. Thioglobulin levels, the antibody levels went down pretty nicely. And at year four, she had a lateral neck uh, lymph node, a suspicious lymph node. It was PTC. She had completion thyroidectomy, radioiodine, and now she's healthy. So it's just one patient, but just to show you what a nice decrease in antibodies in the face of recurrence. That leads us to the next question. What is the impact of Hashimoto's thyroiditis on thioglobulin levels? And we had 52 patients with a diagnosis of Hashimoto thyroiditis, and only 38% of them had TG antibodies, because we defined patients as Hashimoto thyroiditis according to anti-TPO antibodies, treated hypothyroidism before either surgery, and a pathologic report of uh, lymphocytic thyroiditis. So it was a large group and only part of them had antibodies. So we could assess the levels of thyroglobulin in this group. So here you see the numbers in patients with Hashimoto's without antibodies as compared to non-Hashimoto patients and there's no difference. It's 14.7 versus 12.6 with a large standard deviation, completely um, uh, couldn't be differentiated, no statistical uh, difference. Here you see, just, just to show you one point, in the empty triangles is the non-Hashimoto 
group and in the black triangle you see thioglobulin in Hashimoto's patients and the only thing to look to see in this graph is to see that they overlap one goes down one goes up you really can't differentiate differentiate these two groups and in the dotted line you can see antibodies in the in patients with Hashimoto's and again there was no consistent uh, pattern in their behavior over time. What about contralateral nodules? So 62% of patients had contralateral nodules. Now that seems like a very large number and we had a lot of data about these patients from a previous study that we published about contralateral nodules in patients following lobectomy. So these are all the nodules larger than three millimeters. So many times four millimeter, five millimeter nodules are not considered in the decision for surgery. And patients who had larger nodules um, had to have an FNA for not have completion thyroidectomy. So we had 106 patients with any type of contralateral nodule. Median size was 8.8 .8 mm, and in 20% of them, uh, the nodule in the remaining lobe was larger than one centimeter. So again, let's look at thioglobulin levels in the first year of follow-up. And again, there's no difference. So it's 13.1 versus 10.5 with the large um, uh, standard deviation, they completely overlap, uh, and even looking at patients who had larger uh, nodules in the remaining globe, larger than one centimeter, also in these patients the mean uh, thioglobulin was 15.3 nanograms per ml with a large confidence interval, with a large standard deviation, which means pretty wide dispersion of numbers. So again, no difference between the two groups. So in discussion, for discussion, we have distinctive cohort of patients. Uh, lobectomy for PTC, we had sufficient data on thioglobulin and antibodies. We looked at, we think, interesting subgroups of Hashimoto's and contralateral nodularity, and we had pretty good follow-up. The, uh, the mean follow-up period was six and a half years. And with this cohort, post lobectomy thioglobulin levels and change did not predict recurrence, and there was no significant difference also in patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and contralateral nodules. Now, the question is well, should we stop measuring thioglobulin, or do we have any use of thyroid? of thioglobulin after lobectomy. So several weak points that we can take from, from the study. There was a trend. So in the recurrence group, thioglobulin was a little higher. It was about 22, while in the uh, non-recurrent group, thioglobulin was around 11. The confidence in the standard deviation was large, but maybe in a very large uh, cohort, you could see statistically significant difference, but even if you could, the overlap is so large that even if you have statistically significant difference, when you see a patient with thioglobulin of 20, 30, or 40, it's, you really don't have much information about their risk of recurrence. Another interesting point was the group with extreme changes. So in patients who had an increase of more than 20 nanograms per ml, the risk of recurrence was 25%, and that's in comparison to 7% recurrence in the entire group. So again, if a patient has significant increase in thioglobulin, it makes sense to, to look for any disease or maybe if the, the increase is very considerable, maybe even consider completion thyroidectomy. Now, the most interesting question that we had 
is what about extremely high values? So in our study, the highest Thai globulin level that we had was 106. And the question was, if a patient has thioglobulin of 300, of 700, what do you do then? And for that, we looked at a previous study uh, from our group by Dr. Roshaga Slutsky. Um, uh, it was published in 2018 in endocrine practice. And in this study, we had a different, uh, a different goal. So we collected, Dr. Slutsky collected, patients from all over the country who on initial surgery had pathology, the pathologic um, result was benign follicular adenoma. So patients, most of them had lobectomy, benign follicular adenoma, that was the, the initial diagnosis, and then years later were diagnosed with distant metastasis either with thioglobulin or imaging or other modality. So here we have an unusual opportunity to, to see patients who had lobectomy. We know they now have distant metastasis. And it was very interesting for us to look at what were the thioglobulin levels in these patients. And that's what you can see in this table. And here marked in pink, you can see the numbers. So the numbers that are highlighted are in patients who had lobectomy and eventually diagnosed with distant metastasis. And you see that the numbers here are much higher. So the lowest number here is 246 and it goes up to more than 3000. So still we think it's very anecdotal, but it's hard to find such circumstances in clinical practice to do the study, but it does sound reasonable in patients with very high thyroid globulin in the hundreds to consider completion thyroidectomy just to be on the safe side. So in conclusion, thyroid globulin used independently is of limited value to predict or detect local original recurrence following lobectomy and other potential roles of thioglobulin, such as excluding distant metastasis, as we just discussed, uh, should be further studied. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Uh, that was awesome. And I congratulate you on uh, the amount of detail that you put into this study. Uh, before I let Mike Tuttle um, make some comments here, I just want to um, have everybody take a look at the upper right portion of their screen. And there's a, um, an area that allows you to enter questions by tapping on um, a, uh, an icon in the upper uh, area. And that opens up a chat box. Um, and so um, um, uh, if you could uh, make um, some notes there, and I'll try to call upon you uh, or if you want to just put your questions into the text box, I'll go ahead and read those out after Mike has an opportunity to go ahead and uh, uh, make some comments. Um, so uh, Ayal, once again, thank you. And uh, Mike, it's all yours. Thanks, Ayal. That was a uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I will admit during your fellowship when we talked about critiquing data and questioning what we were doing, I really envisioned you critiquing other people's data and not mine, <laughs> but uh, you you seem to have overcome that quite well. Uh, listen, I, I I think your data is right on the money, um, and and the reason this is so important to me right now is when we originally were thinking about this 30 nanograms per mL cutoff, it was really at a time when people were doing lobectomy for subcentimeter papillary cancers, um, and in those the risk of recurrence is one or two percent. So almost any threshold you set would have a wonderful negative predictive value because the event rate was so low. But now that we're starting to do lobectomies in the one and two and three and four centimeters, knowing whether or not this thyroid globulin is reliable is really important. Um, in truth and advertising, people often ask where we came up with that 30 nanograms per ml. Uh, it was a really difficult math equation because in the United States, the normal range of thyroid globulin goes up to about 60. We figured the surgeons took out half the thyroid, divided it by two, and that gave us 30. 
Um, and that's really where that sort of 30 threshold came from. So when I look at its role right now, as I'm trying to use it now, I agree with you in, in initial risk stratification, if we've done a lobectomy and the thyroid globulin comes back 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, that's very worrisome for us. Now, if there's multiple nodules in the other lobe, that may be where it's coming from. Um, but those really high numbers uh, can herald the few follicular cancers with vascular invasion or follicular variants with vascular invasion or like the peripheral cells, some of those that you excluded from this study. Um, I still think a TGF 300 is going to be more false positives than real disease, given the low incidence of distant metastasis, but it would certainly make you look at it. Um, in terms of how we use it over dynamic risk stratification, I think your conclusions are right on the money. Um, I've had several patients over the years, the thyroid globulin gradually go up. I made the mistake of doing a completion thyroidectomy with our surgeons based on just a rising thyroid globulin, and all we found was benign nodules in the contralateral lobe. So like you, we don't operate on those changing numbers, but big changes would make a decision for me. Next slide. Um, in the United States, we often use uh, uh, an electronic textbook called Up to Date um, that is a, a source for lots of people. That's where I go if I have a question about some sort of issue. And I've had the pleasure of uh, writing the Up to Date sections with uh, David Cooper and Gene Mulder as our editors. Um, this is not in Up to Date yet, but it will be in a couple weeks uh, because your timing of reviewing this article is good. Um, I was reviewing this section of UpToDate about two weeks ago and saw not only AOL's paper here in the bottom, <clears throat> but two other papers as well. Um, and this is the section that talks about how to use thyroid globin after lobectomy. In the line that struck out, you can see what it used to say. It used to say a rising value suspicious for uh, thyroid cancer, and then I put or growth of normal tissue to give myself an out. Uh, but clearly that was leaning in the wrong direction. This is what the new language is going to say. Previously, a rising TG value over time was considered to be a reliable marker. However, uh, several recent studies demonstrated that this change in TIA is not a reliable recurrent disease. And in fact, if you put all three papers together, individual rising TGs are more likely to be related to benign nodules. In some studies, it was related to TSH and less likely be related to thyroid cancer. Again, because the risk of recurrence is fairly low. Next slide. So if I look at the big picture, um, what is it that we sort of think about how we follow these patients after lobectomy? First is we have to understand that almost everybody we chose for a lobectomy is either ATA low risk or living right on that border between low and intermediate risk, uh, which means the risk of recurrence is going to be somewhere between 1% and 10%. Uh, so AL data is right in there. Overall survival is essentially 100%. Um, you just very seldom see anybody die that you've properly selected for a lobectomy. The second piece of the puzzle is you have to recognize in these low and intermediate risk patients that minimal disease detection is not necessary. Um, you don't get a bonus if you find a two millimeter papillary in the contralateral lobe. You may not even have done any good if you find a nine millimeter papillary in the contralateral lobe that barely changed over 20 years. So this idea that we have to use TG or tons of imaging to find those recurrences in these low risk patients as soon as we can so that we can rush into a surgery and save their lives um, is just not correct in our view. Last slide. So what do we do with these guys? Um, th this is like old school. So in our hands, the primary way that we're interested in finding recurrence disease after a lobectomy is actually physical exam. Um, I know that's heresy, and I know that goes completely away from minimal disease detection. And people often say, well, you don't know what will happen to these patients if you don't follow every two weeks with an ultrasound. Uh, yeah, we do. It was called 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990. Groups that did lobectomies followed these patients with their hand. They operated when there was palpable disease and we still had survival rates that were 100%. So I'm not gonna tell you I never do an ultrasound. I certainly do, um, probably every two or three years or less frequently after that. I warn the patients if I do ultrasounds, I'm more likely to find false positives, either benign nodules in the contralateral lobe or atypical lymph nodes. And we try to 
strike that right balance. Uh, like AOS data, we don't suppress their TSHs. We made up any TSH less than three, we're pretty happy with. Lots of these folks keep a TSH around one or one and a half. Um, and then like with the ultrasound, we'll occasionally do the thyroglobulin numbers over time, looking for minor changes, not TG changes of one or one and a half. So I think now the data is pretty strong from AOS paper and two other ones. There's another one coming out from Italy that's going to be published pretty soon that shows using thyroglobulin as an individual marker has poor specificity and poor sensitivity in the setting of a lobectomy. You certainly can't think about it the same way you think about it after a total thyroidectomy or a total with radioactive iodine. But like AL, I wouldn't totally discard it. Um, I think it's probably worthwhile looking for those very high numbers. Uh, but again, recognizing that's going to be an unusual event. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, what I'd like to do, I think that's hugely helpful. Uh, what I'd like to do is just um, put a few questions out there for Al and for Mike, and then I'm going to let Dr. Davies um, unmute in just a moment. Uh, one of the questions I would like to, um, is there any importance to preoperative cyber guard in level? Al, want to comment on that? that to preoperative? Yes. Um, we don't usually measure thyroglobulin before surgery. Uh, it's also in the ATA that they don't recommend doing that. And that's because we have a lot of cases, probably Mike too, where you do have data. You didn't take it, but someone else uh, tested for thyroglobulin before surgery. And then you have a low risk disease and before surgery, thyroglobulin is 300 and you're risking the patients of over-treating them. Um, especially now that we know that thyroglobulin is not such a good tool for follow-up. So we usually don't. We measure thyroglobulin only after surgery. Um, there is a case for testing before surgery because there are some patients who have lobectomy. After lobectomy, they have thyroglobulin of zero. Sometimes you detect antibodies, sometimes you don't. Um, and many times people want to say, I want to see the change to have a feeling of where I stand. But again, given the data in the literature, postoperative thyroglobulin is not helpful. So also preoperative thyroglobulin is not that helpful. Only rare cases of very high levels. Great. And uh, Dr. Um, Smith had raised a question about, um, in your cohort, uh, how many patients or what percentage of the patients who had a lobectomy required long term uh, levothyroxine supplementation? So, unfortunately, we didn't have this data because, in many cases, um, we had the numbers. We could find a uh, diagnosis of completion surgery. But in, there were quite a lot of cases where we weren't sure if patient is taking them, uh, taking the drugs or not. Um, now, as we understand it, it wasn't a big pitfall because we looked at TSH levels and the, the amount, the, the impact on thyroglobulin is dependent on, on TSH and not if they're taking the pills or they're taking levothyroxine or not. So we didn't have good data about that, but we did have data about the TSH levels. Great. So um, I think uh, Dr. Davies had a few comments here. Good morning. Uh, I also um, have a very nice presentation. Uh, and obviously Mike did a good job of training. I don't, we don't hear you. Don't hear me. Be a little louder, Terry. Yeah, there we go. That's yeah. great. I was actually saying it was good to meet you, I am. Um, <laughs> nice to uh, meet you. Congratulating Michael on a, on a good uh, graduate. Um, I had some minor comments. Uh, uh, as I, as last week, I always look at the journal you publish in to see whether the paper is likely to be any good or not. And on this count, I can't criticize you at all. Um, we all agree JC&M is well-reviewed and 
when I was a boy, uh, we were taught never to use thyroglobulin as a measurement after a lobectomy. And biologically, it doesn't make much sense because the, the lobe is secreting a goodly amount of thyroglobulin. And to look for a metastasis, it's going to make a big impact on that is, 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 is not biologically really very logical. Um, so the only time I was taught to use thyroglobulin <clears throat> was when patients had their TSH suppressed. So if they had a, a hemi and they went on thyroid suppression and you kept the TSH low, then you could look for a rising thyroglobulin. And I think there are some data on that. Um, but these days we don't like to suppress TSH because we worry about the bones and the heart. I don't know how significant that is, but we don't tend to do it very much. My major concern to both you and Michael is that you had 12 contralateral carcinomas in this group. 167. So that gives you a sort of 8% recurrence on the other side. Now, why would you do a hemi when you've got nodules on the other side? Why not just do a total thyroidectomy and be done with it? I, I don't really see that as a, a useful recommendation unless, as Michael seems to imply, that a recurrence of 8 to 10% is fine, but as long as it's not the doctor. Uh, but to me, that's a <laughs> an unacceptable recurrence rate. Okay. So, so I... I, so I would I would agree with you, Terry. Eight um, percent is an unacceptable well, recurrence rate, as is as is one percent an unacceptable recurrence rate. So when we when we talk about patients that we're going to do a lobectomy or not, if there are nodules in the other lobe, many patients do choose to go ahead and have the other taken out just to be done with it. Um, but an eight percent recurrence rate means eight percent lose their entire thyroid over their life, as opposed to a hundred percent. So when we do a lobectomy, patients have to accept that there is, I tell them somewhere around five to 10% risk that we'll find disease in the contralateral lobe that will eventually need to be taken care of. Um, most of the people that seek me out for lobectomy are trying to avoid thyroid hormone therapy if they can. They really value their own organ. Some of them have um, a real fear of having both recurrent ringual nerves damaged or my sister had the thyroid taken out. She gained 100 pounds. So if you're doing a lobectomy in the setting of nodules on the other side, there's usually some motivating factor from the patient. But, you know, I think it's up to the individual patients. People that say an 8% recurrence on the other side is too much, they want it taken out. You can get their recurrences down to 2 or 3% if you do a total, but you can't take it to zero. So uh, your points are well taken. Great. I, I'd um, like to at a point about the, the, the hemithyroidectomy, we always have a discussion with the patients um, the, with having total thyroidectomy versus hemithyroidectomy. And it's interesting because Israel is a small country and there's a Facebook group of patients with uh, thyroid cancer. And many patients who have new diagnosis go into this group. And the leaders of the group uh, most of them had total thyroidectomy and they don't feel well and they're not happy with the drugs and they're telling everyone, please try, try and have a lobectomy. And in recent years, because of things that are not up to us, you know, it's just out there, the, the patients talking to patients, many patients come to clinic and they say, I want to have a lobectomy. If I have to, I'll have a total thyroidectomy. I'm willing to take a seven, eight percent risk of completion, still have 90 plus percent risk uh, chances of being with my thyroid, less complications, less liver thyroxine. And I see it as an interesting, as part of what we do to, to tailor the, the treatment for the patient and letting them know the, the advantages, disadvantages of each approach. Well, let me just answer that, if I may, because, yeah, I mean, of course, you're right. Patients should decide. But I'm a big believer that the physician can convince almost all patients to do exactly what he wants. So it's yeah. a matter of how you present the information. Right. Entirely. 
I would leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And, and and we'll agree we'll agree with you completely, Terry. There's no question about that. How how we frame that discussion makes a difference. Yep. Yeah. I believe I have just one more question um, for you. Uh, this is um, related to thyroglobulin antibodies um, in patients who do have antibodies. Do you disregard Tg levels, or does it depend on the titer of the antibody? Um, and the level of the TG? Well, when patients have antibodies, I accept that I don't know what thioglobulin levels mean. So some of them have thioglobulin of zero, some of them have thioglobulin of five, 10, 20. We, knows, we know that antibodies have uh, different epitopes that they affect. So in different machines, you have different um, amount of interference. So usually when a patient has antibodies, I look at the antibodies and not as much on thioglobulin. And many times when antibodies go up or down, thioglobulin changes. And we really, I really don't have an idea. I think we all don't have an idea what it means. Great. Um, all right, terrific. Well, listen, I want to thank Ayal and I want to thank Mike and everybody on the line uh, for participating. Um, and in the interest of letting everybody get back to their lives, um, and we will be sending information out regarding uh, Journal Club for next Friday. Um, and uh, certainly welcome everyone's comments and suggestions and questions um, in the meantime. Uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you um, everybody. You're welcome. Stay safe, everyone.